go. So I'm recording now. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about cardiac emergencies and obviously how that ties into the geriatric patient. So um, the main um, cardiac emergencies we deal with or talk about and deal with on a ELS level would be angina and acute myocardial infarction and pulmonary edema. Right? Those are kind of the three main things we see um, from a uh, you know from the standpoint of uh, pre-hospital medicine. That's, that's the vast majority of what we you know come across. So let's talk about like the pathophysiology, what happens to people, why they get these problems, and so on and so on, and then we'll talk about what we do with them. Okay. So most people have heart disease, something called from something called coronary artery disease, right? Which is we know the coronary arteries are the blood vessels that are run across the wall of the heart. Okay, they're on the surface of the, of the heart, and they provide the heart with the oxygen and nutrients it needs to uh, contract, and it removes the waste products um, of that energy, of that burning of that energy to make the uh, contraction. And they're small, right? They're pretty small arteries and stuff like that. So, you know, our diet tends to be very high in fatty foods. Uh, we don't get a lot of physical activity, you know, and the combination of the two leads us to have uh, plaque deposits, fat deposits in the inside of those coronary arteries. Okay, so what happens in angina, okay, and we know that angina is a progressive disease that typically manifests itself in, you know, the 60s, late 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, because it takes a while for us to really screw up our arteries before they get to the point where, you know, there's problems and stuff like that. In angina, there's two things that happen. We have that fat in the inside of the arteries, and there's also calcium that infiltrates the walls of the arteries. And the old term for angina was hardening of the arteries, because arteries have the ability to constrict and dilate. They're the only blood vessels that really have that ability to constrict and dilate. So when you're running for the bus, the arteries in your heart have to dilate, open up, to let more blood get to your heart so that the heart gets the oxygen it needs to be able to exert itself so that you could run. Now, if the calcium infiltrates the arteries and they can't dilate, now you have a mismatch between the amount of oxygen your heart needs to do what you want it to do versus what it's getting. So that, that you know, and there's a term called myocardial, which is heart muscle, myocardial oxygen demand. So right now, sitting around, you know, not doing much, we don't have a very high myocardial oxygen demand. But if we got up and started exercising, we would increase it. And our body could meet it because we breathe deeper, our heart would pump harder and everything like that. The problem is when somebody has angina and the heart starts to pump harder, because the arteries are narrowed and stiff, it can't get the oxygen that the heart needs. And then the heart reverts from aerobic metabolism, which is making energy with oxygen and sugar, to anaerobic metabolism which is making without it. And the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. And when lactic acid, you've all felt lactic acid in the muscle, you got a pain in your side, your, your arm started to shake when you had them above your head, fixing a light bulb and stuff. Um, when that happens, a muscle doesn't work well. So when lactic acid goes into the heart, you get chest pain. Right? So that's the, the number one reason. I mean, most of the times the test says the cause of the chest pain is lack of oxygen. The lack of oxygen is what causes the anaerobic metabolism, which is what causes the lactic acid, which is what causes pains. In a way, it could be, you know, you could say oxygen would be correct. But the actual culprit of the chest pain is the lactic acid. So angina is an episodic thing where most of the times people in angina are fine, and then they do something to increase the amount of oxygen their heart needs. And because they have angina, they can't get it there. So they have chest pain because their heart's exerting itself and it can't get the oxygen. And most intelligent people would then sit down okay, and start to reverse what they call reverse the precipitating factors, you know, reverse what brought it on. And, they, and their pain should start to get less by just sitting down and stop. You know, if they're walking up flights of stairs and they stop walking, their pain should start to minimize and it should probably go away within a half hour, 45 minutes. <clears throat> um, now, once somebody has an episode of angina, obviously the first time you can't really tell the difference between a heart attack and angina or something. So they're going to go to the hospital. They're going to get a workup. They're going to get a uh, cardiac catheterization. They're going to look up into their arteries of their heart, and they're going to see that none are completely blocked, but that some are narrowed, and you know some are um, calcified and stuff like that. And depending on the hospital, depending on your insurance, you may get stented in certain arteries if they're real narrow. Um, but a lot of literature now is saying that people with angina can be managed just as well with pharmacological intervention than with stenting. Okay, and stenting has risks. So it really depends on, you know, like if you're in a teaching hospital where most of the doctors are being paid a salary regardless of what they do, you might be managed very conservatively and you just try some medications and see if it works for a couple of months. And if you're in a hospital where the doctors get paid by doing procedures and you have good insurance, you're absolutely going to get stented 
you know, because that's how they make their money. You know, and you've signed a consent that if during the procedure they decide they need to stent you, they're going to stent you. So and you're a little doped up anyway, and they're just going to tell you, oh, we have to do that procedure we talked about, and you're going to wind up getting some stents. Um, which again, you know, was, may not be the worst thing, right? Ultimately, some people need to do their pharmacological interventions. Now, how do we get how do we get the patient with angina? We typically get the patient with angina who knows they have angina, and they've been prescribed a medication called nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin is a smooth muscle relaxant, and your blood vessels have smooth muscle in them. So when somebody's having chest pain and they take nitroglycerin, it relaxes their arteries and lets a little more blood get to the heart so that pain starts to get relieved. So the combination of rest, relaxation, maybe oxygen by the police, oxygen by us, okay, some psychological first aid and nitroglycerin. All of a sudden now the heart is getting all the oxygen it needs. The person has stopped the, the exertion and the pain goes away. So pain, that chest, chest pain that typically goes away is not typically a heart attack. I'm not saying it can't be, but it's not typically a heart attack, okay? So if you have a story of exertional pain, okay, um, and it can be intense, and a person can break out in a cold sweat, they could have all the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, right? Um, but it starts to go away and maybe goes away completely with rest, oxygen, and nitroglycerin, it's usually more of an angina type of attack. Now, can somebody who has angina overexert themselves to the point where they actually cause a heart attack and damage their heart? Sure. Is it common? No, because most people aren't stupid. And if they're having chest pain, they don't continue to do, you know, something to uh, injure themselves. Okay. Now, later we're going to talk about angina as far as nitroglycerin and medications and interactions and when we use it and we don't use it and stuff like that. But right now, we just talk about angina. So again, angina is caused long-term uh, coronary artery disease, okay, where we get plaque in the inside of our arteries and calcium leads to the arteries not being able to dilate and give enough blood to the heart when there's some type of physical exertion. It could be psychological, actually. It could be stress, uh, but most of the times it's physical. So now they person doesn't get enough oxygen to the heart, they have chest pain, and we get involved. Okay? There's no way for us to 100% know it's angina versus a heart attack, so we're always going to transport those patients. Angina patients can have ST elevation, just like a heart attack patient has. So there's no way to 100% know, but you would have a very strong suspicion if the patient says, you know, when you got here, the pain was a 9 out of 10. Now it's a 7 out of 10. You're going to the hospital, and they say, eh, maybe it's a 1. You know, and by the time you get to the hospital, I don't have pain anymore. That, ten that tends to be more of angina. It could also be indigestion. But, you know, if we're talking heart, it tends to be more of angina. Now, what's the acute myocardial infarction? That's the heart attack, right? So what's the difference? They're both caused by coronary artery disease, okay? Um, and in the, the case of an acute myocardial infarction, that fat that's inside your arteries gets covered by a fibrous cap to lock it in place, and that cap ruptures. The number one reason why that cap over the fat in your arteries ruptures is inflammation, stress, um, it could be gingivitis, it could be chronic inflammatory processes, it could be a stressful, just like COVID is a really an inflammation problem more than it's a breathing problem, and that inflammation leads to the, the breathing problems they're finding now. It's the same thing like a heart attack. A heart attack is caused by chronic stress and inflammation, okay? And it releases substances, you know, cytokines and different stress uh, substances into your bloodstream that weaken that cap over the fat and that cap ruptures, and the body thinks it's a cut, and it sends platelets to cover up, just like it would if you had a cut on the outside of your skin, and those platelets seal off the artery, okay? So angina is a temporary problem. A heart attack is kind of a permanent problem until we can reopen that artery, and right now, the only thing we have to reopen that artery would it be angioplasty or the administration of drugs called thrombolytics. You probably heard the term TPA. It's one type of thrombolytic um, that dissolves the clot, okay? So until that clot is dissolved, that person continues to have a heart attack. Now, what could someone do to minimize the heart attack? So we know oxygen may play a role, and we're very much guided by pulse oximetry, and we'll talk about that. Okay. But the big thing would be early administration of baby aspirin. Baby aspirin and platelets don't mix well. And baby aspirin basically does not allow platelets to stick so that that clot that's supposed to be developing doesn't really develop to the same degree once people start taking baby aspirin. We'll talk all about baby aspirin in a second. Now, just to understand what's going on, we have two emergencies, so to speak, or two, two conditions that could happen in a blood vessel. We have a thrombotic, a thrombus, and we have an embolic, or an embolism. So embolisms are clots that break away from someplace else and float and lodge further down the bloodstream. 
So you know that as you know that as a stroke, right? You know that as a pulmonary embolism. Those are clots that originated somewhere else in the body and got lodged in the brain, got lodged in the lung. Okay, so those are embolic events. A heart attack is not typically an embolic event. It's typically a thrombotic event, which means that the injury occurred at the site inside the artery where the fat was. And what happened basically is because of the rupture of the cap over the fat, the platelets sealed off that artery because they thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were going to stop a wound, you know, uh, cover up a wound. So in embolic events, there's really not much we could do to get them to the hospital. Okay? In thrombotic events, aspirin plays a big role. Okay? So in a heart attack patient, the quicker somebody gets aspirin on board, the less damage they will have. In fact, if somebody was to have chest pain and immediately take you know, baby aspirin and chew it and swallow it to let it go to work right away, they probably would have minimal damage. They'd have minimal clotting. Now, aspirin will not break down a clot that has already occurred, right? So if somebody waited 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to call the ambulance, it took you another 10, 15 minutes to get there, and then another 10 or 15 minutes to get to the hospital, and then another hour to get upstairs to, to the angioplasty suite, okay? Or I should say it. So let's say it takes, us, uh, it takes us 10 minutes, 15 minutes to get there. We give them aspirin. So the 15 minutes prior to the aspirin, they will start having clotting. If that aspirin we give them is not going to break down that clot that already developed, but it will prevent any further clot. So to break down a clot that already developed, you need thrombolytics. We don't carry thrombolytics. So we'll talk all about aspirin when we use it, when we don't use it in a second. Now, the last thing about acute myocardial infarction is you've all heard the story of the, you know, your 80, 90 year old father or grandfather who had three heart attacks, didn't even know he had them, and he's running around playing tennis, right? He's fine, okay? And it's minor heart attacks, no chest pain, and my doctor just told me sort of my EKG. And then you've also heard of the 30 year old, right? 35, 40 year old had one heart attack and died, I admit, or he's a cripple, cardiac cripple. So why does a young person who has a heart attack typically have a worse outcome than an older person who has a heart attack? So remember I said that this is a condition that took a while to develop, right? Your, your coronary artery disease that caused both angina and a heart attack takes decades and decades to develop, okay? But on autopsy of younger people, they, they, already, they already see the start of coronary artery disease. When they do autopsies on soldiers that were killed in battle, they already see the start of coronary artery disease in people's arteries. And you know, you're talking people in their 20s, right? So, I mean, it is a progressive disease and it can be um, prevented and it can even be somewhat reversed. Uh, but when we start getting up into our 50s and 60s, the problem is, we can't reverse it very easy with diet and exercise. We need to start getting on medications, you know, and anti-lipid agents and stuff like that. So going back to the um, why does the older heart attack patients sometimes do better than the younger one? If your body sensed over 10, 20 years that there were certain parts of your heart that were not getting enough blood because those arteries, those coronary arteries were narrowed, it doesn't say, you know, Frank, you ate like a pig. So this is your life now. What it says is, I'm gonna grow more blood vessels in that area to make up for the blocked blood vessels. And that's called collateral circulation. So they have the main coronary artery. That's not doing a good job anymore because it's kind of gunked up. So what it does is it grows branches, okay, off that artery before it was blocked up to supply the area with um, more blood flow. So now when that older person has a heart attack, okay, and, and a blood vessel gets a little blocked off, they have other blood vessels in the same area that are servicing it. Now, it's not 100% because you, your likelihood of surviving a heart attack is based on a couple of things. It's based on which arteries get blocked. So arteries that service the left side of the heart are more important than arteries that serve the right side. Arteries that service the ventricles are more important than arteries that service the atriums. So that's one decision making, but it also depends on where does it get blocked? So all your coronary arteries originate at the base of your aorta where it comes off your left ventricle. That's where they all start. If the blockage occurs a quarter of an inch off your aorta, that entire length of that artery is blocked. And you're not going to do well. You're probably going to die. But if the clot floats down the main branch of, say, your left descending coronary artery and lodges further down, or maybe a branch of your left descending coronary artery, you're going to do better because the vast majority of the artery is open. It's just a smaller area. You know, so if you had you know, an artery that's this long, and if this is where it started, my right hand is where it started, right over here, but it blocked it way down over here, I still have blood flow getting to the vast majority of my heart. If I have it blocking right from where it originates, nothing can get past it, so I have a much bigger infarct, a much larger area of muscle. 
So some of it is luck, right? I mean, you know, some of it is luck, just like when people have a V-fib arrest in the field, you know, the people that survive are the ones that have uh, automatic external defibrillation quickly. So that usually involves, you know, a bystander in the supermarket or the store or the church or something like that, or a police officer. Um, it doesn't usually involve us because by the time we get there, right, it's, uh, it's usually too late. Once in a while, you know, we're lucky and we get there pretty quickly and the person is close to where we are. But most of the times it's the police because they're always on the road or they were in a place that had an AED and somebody pulled it off the wall and followed the instructions, you know, the, the voice prompts and used it. So, you know, it's just sometimes a matter of luck. Okay, does anybody have any questions on what angina is, what acute myocardial infarction is? Um, and we're gonna talk about how we treat it in, you know, in a couple of minutes. Now, it's so just some other cardiac conditions. Congestive heart failure and acute pulmonary edema are kind of one and the same. Congestive heart failure is kind of a day-to-day -day chronic condition that people live with, okay, where they have trouble breathing because of a problem with their heart backing up into their lungs. Um, when they have the emergency state, that's called acute pulmonary edema. So when they call us in the middle of the night and say they woke up and couldn't catch their breath and they're all scared and they won't follow commands and they're fighting the oxygen mask and pulling it off, that's acute pulmonary edema, right? But when they take medications, water pills and different pills at home, and they sit around with their ankles swollen and maybe they have to sleep in, in a recliner that's sitting up, but they manage it and they get around and stuff, that's congestive heart failure. Right? Now, what's the cause? There can be many causes, right? I mean, you know, we even have a COVID where patients go into a form of acute pulmonary edema, but it's not from their heart. And, but the main typical reasons are is that they have damage to the left ventricle. Now, that damage could be because they had high blood pressure for years, and they didn't treat it. So if you have unchecked high blood pressure, that means your left ventricle has to pump into your aorta against a higher pressure. So your left ventricle has to squeeze harder every moment of every day, and you get something called left ventricular hypertrophy, where the left ventricle gets very big and, and floppy, and that doesn't lead to a good left ventricle, and blood doesn't get pumped out well into the aorta, so the blood starts to back up into the left atrium, and then it backs up into the pulmonary vein, and then it backs up into the lungs, and once the lungs get engorged with fluid, it forces the plasma out of the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli, and that's congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema. They feel like they're drowning because their own plasma is filling up their alveoli, and, and you know, they are drowning, but not from like a swimming pool type of thing. Could also be that the mitral valve, right, the, the bicuspid valve between the left atrium and left ventricle is not closing completely. Now that, that valve should close when the left ventricle is pumping into the aorta, right? So if your left ventricle is pumping you should close your mitral valve so blood can't go backwards up into your left atrium, and you should open up your aortic valve so blood can go out into your aorta. So if those valves are sticky and don't work right, they don't close completely or don't open completely, blood may actually go backwards and fill back up into the right atrium and therefore pressurize the atrium and pressurize the lungs, and the same thing happens. So there's a lot of different reasons why, but uh, most of the times it's a sick heart, right, that's causing it. Now, these, again, are patients that call us, they're starved, for, for air. Now, we come and put the non rebreather on them years ago, right? We used to put the non rebreather on them and they pull it off. And I never could wrap my head around, like, why is this patient who's you know, dying for oxygen pulling off the non rebreather? And the reason why is they don't sense a need for oxygen, they sense a need for air. So, like, if I put my hands over your mouth, right, you don't know, you don't know that you want oxygen. You know you want to be able to breathe. It's the same thing like these people. All they know is that when they take a breath, they want to feel air coming in. So we strap the non rebreather over their face, even though it's giving them close to 100% oxygen, they don't sense a lot of flow and it feels claustrophobic and they rip it off because they have what's called air hunger, not oxygen. I mean, they do need oxygen, but they just want nothing over their face. So we had a big problem. Every time we did it, they ripped it off. It was very hard to keep them on it. You know, and it was a very challenging life at a hospital. Now we go with CPAP, right? Nowadays, CPAP is the treatment, both BLS, ALS, hospital, everybody is in congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, in a bad shape, they get CPAP. Now, the problem with CPAP is if a nod or breather made them feel claustrophobic, CPAP makes them feel 100% more claustrophobic because it's much bigger. So on one hand, it's going to help them because when a patient has CPAP on and they open their mouth, they get air forced into their airways. So they don't have that air hunger anymore. It's a kind of almost feels like, you know, you have your, your head sticking out a car window. And the other thing it does is it pressurizes their alveoli and kind of forces the water that's down there out. So it's definitely the appropriate treatment for somebody in acute pulmonary edema. But to be able to use it, you have to kind of be a little bit of a salesman. Now, 
if your patient is a chronic CHF or calling you know, every week and they go into the hospital and they put on CPAP all the time, they probably know how to put it on better than you do and they're not gonna fight you. It's the patient, it's the first time. And now you're strapping this big, huge device over their face. You know it has to have a decent seal or else you don't get the pressure under the mask. And that's all kind of claustrophobic in patients. So one is you have to feel confident in using it. You can't be fumbling around or anything because you're only getting a one shot in using it. And two, I would do it around to the hospital. I don't like CPAP in the house for a couple of reasons. You're going to go through a hell of a lot of oxygen portable bottles if you're having any problem getting the patient out of the house. And, and then the other thing is carrying a patient out of the house in general is a very scary procedure. So you just make it more scary when they have this big, huge device. So I would just bring them out as quick as I can to the ambulance, let them calm down, start going to the hospital, and then explain to them what the CPAP is and put it on and you know, explain to them that it does have to fit snugly to your face. It shouldn't be super tight, but it does have to fit snugly to your face or else you won't generate any pressure under the mask. Okay? So the main treatment nowadays, like I said, on, on all disciplines, BLS, ALS, hospital, everything, or congestive heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, the patient is symptomatic, would be the administration of a, a CPAP for that patient. Now, what is the pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis? So you notice that all of them in itis. So itis is an infection, right? appendicitis, you know, and it's, it's an infection in something. Now, all of this, since we're talking about the heart, is the heart. So pericarditis is an inflammation or infection in the pericardial sac, which is a sac that surrounds the heart and protects the heart. A myocarditis, myo means muscle, so it's an actual infection of the heart muscle itself. And an endocarditis is an infection on the inside of the heart. In other words, if, you know, the coronary arteries are on the outside of the heart, the, the, um, the endocardium, the, the smooth, shiny layer that the heart actually touches, I mean, I'm sorry, the blood actually touches on the inside of the heart is, the, is, the, is where that infection occurs. Now, why does somebody get an infection in the heart? And in all honesty, they're not lucky, right? So it's not a primary infection that started in their heart. It is an infection that started somewhere else in their body and migrated to their heart because they're not lucky. It could be getting your teeth cleaned, it could be getting a tooth extracted, it could be an earache, earache it could be a, a chest cold, it could be a cut on your arm, but somehow you're not lucky and that bacteria or virus goes to your heart. And initially it's a very hard diagnosis because they look like they have the flu. They're tired, they're sleepy, they run down, right? Because their heart can't pump. And you know, who's gonna think of this, you know, this situation? And you know, it's, it's a tough thing, you know? And, and this could, is something that could happen in a young, healthy person. You know, it's not uncommon in first year college, right? Freshman year college where they leave mommy's you know, warm, nurturing environment and go away to school. And now they're you know, trying to manage their lives. They have a heavy school load, plus they have some social life and they get run down and tired. And when you run down and tired, your immune system doesn't work right. Plus they're around thousands of other little reservoirs of bacteria and viruses with their schoolmates. It can happen during basic training in the military, same thing, right? You're all run down and tired. And your immune system doesn't work when you run down and tired. So, you know, a normal virus or bacteria that enters your body, your immune system will usually defeat. But when you run down and tired, it doesn't. And they're just not lucky and it goes to their, it goes to their heart. So if you ever get the story of somebody who's been in an immune suppressed state, you know, maybe they're on they chemo, maybe they're on ster long-term steroid use, or maybe they're very young at college, just came home from college, Thanksgiving break or something. Um, you know, and they kind of present with these vague symptoms you know, of, uh, you know, typically what happens is you can't, it's hard to diagnose it without ultrasound and a chest x-ray and stuff like that, but, you know, it does happen. Now, EMS-wise, any of us that have been doing this for a while have seen a patient with pericarditis. We might not have known they had pericarditis, okay? Uh, we might have thought it was a heart attack because it presents a lot like a heart attack, okay? but we probably had somebody who had chest discomfort, okay, and it was turned out probably to be pericarditis. A myocarditis, endocarditis are a little rarer, but the sac does get infected in certain people. So the, 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 the kind of differences of a pericarditis patient from a heart attack patient is that a pericarditis patient usually has a history of a viral or bacterial infection. It doesn't have to be anything severe, but you know, they were sick, right? And they probably had a fever. So their skin is probably warm and moist. Now most heart attack patients don't have warm, moist skin. If anything, they have cool, moist skin because they're scared and they have diaphoresis. And they, most heart attack patients don't have a history of a, a cold. Now, some can, which is be coincidental, but most patients don't have a history of being sick with something. And then the last thing is that the pericarditis patient feels better when they're kind of leaning forward, right? They're taking their pericardial sac and shifting it forward like that. And, um, you know, so if you get somebody you find kind of leaning over the table, 
they tell you they feel better when they're leaning over the table, resting their arms, um, maybe feel better when they're walking, leaning a little bit, and they have a little fever, they've been sick for a couple of days and stuff like that. It's probably pericarditis. In saying that, we're still going to treat like a heart attack. We're still going to give them aspirin, we're still going to give them oxygen, because until they get a 12 mini kg and an ultrasound of their heart, we can't really fully diagnose pericarditis. So we're going to treat them that. Okay, so any questions on the conditions? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some assessment things, and then we'll talk about treatment. So when we're assessing a patient, right, we're talking about somebody who has chest pain. That chest pain could be interior, it could be posterior, it could be back to their back. Right, it could be to their belly, they could have abdominal discomfort, like an inferior wall of mine. Um, but you know, they, you're thinking more towards the heart. And don't be surprised if you're wrong, because a lot of things, you know, in the chest, you could set, be having aortic, aortic aneurysm, okay, and have chest pain, right? And it's not your heart, it's your aorta. There's a lot of different things that can cause pain in the chest that is not necessarily um, the heart. And it's fine, you know, we're not, we're not doctors, and you know, we do the best that we can do, which is we don't waste time in the house and we get them to the hospital. Now, our OPQRST is a, a mnemonic to remind us of the questions we want to ask. So O is for onset, right? When did it happen? What were you doing? P is provocation. Does anything make it better or worse? Q is quality. So you ask them to describe it. Try not to ask them, is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it fast? Let them describe it. Right? R is radiation. Does the pain radiate any place from your chest to any place else? Now, remember, there are heart attack patients that have radiating pain. Years ago, they used to say, like, pain to the left arm was a heart attack. To this day, I can think of maybe one or two patients who I've had who had chest pain radiating to the left arm. It's much more common to have pain radiating to the back, much more common to have pain radiating to the jaw, to the neck, right, than it is to have pain radiating to their arms, but it could happen, right? So pain radiation is possible. They don't have to have it, but it is possible. Okay. Um, severity on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst, you ask them to give you a number, Ask them what it was when it started, ask them what it is now, and then if you do anything that possibly could reduce the pain, like putting them on oxygen, uh, nitroglycerin, or something like that, um, you reassess their pain uh, threshold. And then a T is time, how long has it been going on? Right? So that's how you kind of always assess chest discomfort, chest pain, or any, any pain. This is the medical term for shortness of breath. So if you have somebody with chest pain who's having shortness of breath, that's obviously much more severe than somebody just having chest pain, because now you have two body systems involved. Orthopnea is positional shortness of breath. So that's more like the CHF or the pulmonary edema patient that when they're lying flat, they have a harder time breathing than when they're sitting up. And that's just gravity, right? When you're lying flat, the, blood, the fluid, your lungs pulls over your entire back of your lung, where if you're sitting up, it only pulls down towards the bases. So it's just really gravity. Diaphoresis is a cold sweat that occurs when somebody is scared, where the body senses somebody's in an emergency state and causes adrenaline to release into their bloodstream. And when adrenaline releases into your bloodstream, the pores on your skin relax and open up and you get a sweat, okay? And because there's no blood going to your skin when adrenaline is released, because adrenaline causes the blood to stay towards the vital organs, the, it's a cold sweat because there's no warm blood going to your skin. Restless and anxiety because they're scared, something's going on. Feeling of impending doom. So you've all probably been on a call where a patient says, I don't think I can stay awake anymore. And I think I'm going to die. Some of them are hypochondriacs, but there are those patients who know it's coming. Okay, so I always encourage them to keep on talking to me, stay awake. And if you had somebody with chest discomfort, right, and you think it's a heart attack, and they, they all of a sudden code right in front of you. And usually when they code right in front of you, their eyes roll back into their head. They have a little seizure activity. Like usually their head will shake, and then they become unresponsive. If that happens, while somebody's ripping out the AED, the closest person to them should strike them forcefully dead center in their chest where you put your hands for CPR. And that's called the precordial bump. And even though it's technically supposed to be a witnessed, in other words, a witnessed monitored cardiac arrest, you witnessed it, you didn't monitor it because you didn't see them going to defib on the monitor. But you know, the worst you're gonna do if you precordial bump someone, okay, is hurt your hand. Now, if they just fainted and you precordial bump them, they're gonna wake up and you'll know they're not dead. They may ask you why you know you punched them in the chest, but you know, but I'm talking about that the patient truly coded. You watch them code in front of you, they have no pulse. Um, most of the times that's a V-fib arrest and a precordial thump is like a mini defibrillation while you're waiting to set up the AED. Remember, if you really have a patient, you think it's going to code and route the hospital. You know, I had uh, last Thursday night I was here, I had a 475, 475 pound 
gentleman in VTAC, sweat pouring off his body, you know, no blood pressure, no radio pulses, you know, couldn't get an IV on him because he's so fat. So we're just driving to the hospital with him. I put the AD pads on him, I put the defibrillator pads on him. You know, he knew exactly what they were for because he had been cardioverted four times before. He made me promise that I wouldn't cardiovert him if he, if he was conscious. I said, I will not cardiovert your conscious, but if you close your eyes, you know, um, I'll have to do it. And the whole ride to the hospital, it was the widest opened eyes you'd ever see. And he kept on touching me in the arm to make sure I looked at his eyes to know that he was awake. He didn't want to get cardioverted. Um, the, the nausea and vomiting is very typical of the inferior wall of mine. So when we classify a heart attack, we classify it by the walls that are involved. So you have an anterior wall. The septal wall is the heart that divides the left and right side. Then you have lateral wall. You have a posterior wall, which is to the back, and they're pain to the back. And you have an inferior wall, which is the bottom wall of the heart that sits right above your diaphragm and your stomach. When people have an inferior wall MI, they have more GI symptoms. Okay? And that's actually a fairly common MI in women. Now, the fatigue is the number one symptom in the elderly, as, and maybe even in diabetics. As we get older, and if we have diabetes, we have neuropathies, which are damage to our nerve endings. And a lot of times, people with neuropathies don't feel the pain, the heart attack pain, the same way as somebody without neuropathy. So in an elderly patient, if they call you fatigue, I always assume it's one or two things. It's a heart attack or it's sepsis, right? Anytime you have a little old person who's just not right, always think of sepsis first, okay? And think it's possibly a, a heart attack. Okay? Palpitations, which is what this gentleman had, right? When he was in VTAC, his heart was pounding away. So he feels that racing of the heart in his chest. And the atypical presentations are the people who don't present like a normal heart attack. And again, that is the diabetic, that is the elderly patient, the geriatric patient, because of neuropathies, the bulk of those are diabetics and the geriatrics. And the last thing is women are considered atypical presentations because a lot of times, one, a lot of people in healthcare don't have a high suspicion of heart attacks in women, and they should, because women have heart attacks just as much as men do. And the other reason is a lot of times they have that inferior wall of MI, which gives the atypical presentation of abdominal discomfort more than chest discomfort. Okay, so what do we do? Make them comfortable, they're scared. The more scared they are, the more adrenaline is released. The more adrenaline that's released, the harder our heart works. So we wanna make them as comfortable as possible. That's why in the hospital they get analgesia where the medics may come and give them pain medicine, okay? To try to calm them down so they have less adrenaline release. We'll also give them beta blockers, which will slow down the pumping action of the heart to kind of not make the heart overexert itself because they're scared. Now, oxygen is a little controversial. Our new protocol, our old protocol said high concentration oxygen for everyone. Our new protocol says oxygen is appropriate. So most of the times they, they define a normal oxygen level as 94, 95%, pulse ox 94, 95%. And they say that if a patient is satting at 94, 95%, there's not a big need for supplemental oxygen. But then we also have the, you know, what if they're wrong situation. And we also have the medical legal, medical legal consideration which is that still, you know, if that patient has a bad outcome and some lawyer looks at the chart, there's probably an expectation that a person who's having chest pain would be on oxygen. And if it's not there, it may be a red flag. So I usually tell people there's no harm, no foul, putting them on a nasal fat here at a liter or two, even if they're sat in at 98%. You know, put them on a uh, oxygen uh, nasal cannula, you know, one or two liters, um, and you're not gonna drive it up the pulse ox much higher, but, you know, you're doing something for them, even if it's just psychological first aid. Then the next most important thing would be the early administration of chewable baby aspirin. So that is the old St. Joseph's chewable baby aspirin type of thing where there's no hard enteric coating. Most aspirin nowadays, when people are taking it every day as a prevention for problems, has a hard coating on it so it does not dissolve in your stomach. Because aspirin, long-term use of aspirin, can cause bleeding in the stomach. So they put a hard coating on it so that instead of dissolving in your stomach, it dissolves in your large intestine. I'm sorry, small intestine. So that's not gonna help somebody having a heart attack because we want it to go to work right away. So we want non enterically coated aspirin and we tell them to chew it and swallow it so it goes to work in minutes versus hours. Remember, before you give them the aspirin, you have to tell them to chew it and swallow it because most people would never think to chew and swallow a medication. They would always think just to swallow it. If they swallow without chewing it, the onset of action is delayed for 30 minutes to an hour. Okay, so you want them to chew it and swallow it. The New York State Protocol mandates 481 milligram chewable baby aspirin. 
So it's about 324 milligrams. Sometimes you'll see it rounded to 325 because it's 80 something. Uh, but 324, 325 is the dosage. Okay. Now, what else do we want to do? If the patient has nitroglycerin, because remember on a BLS level, we don't have nitroglycerin. If, a BL, if the patient has nitroglycerin and you're considering possibly giving them the nitroglycerin, um, you have to ask a couple of questions. One is you want to make sure they're not on an erectile dysfunction medication, right? So the active ingredient in all these medications is called sildenafil, and sildenafil is a vasodilator because that's what allows a man to get an erection, vasodilation, and so is nitroglycerin a vasodilator. So when you give two medicines that do the same thing, they can potentiate the actions and give, do too much vasodilation and drop somebody's blood pressure to the point where the heart does not perfuse itself, right? So we got to be very careful. Now, we also remember, we've talked about this in the past, that that same sildenafil that's used for ED medications is being marketed for other situations. And we'll talk about that in a second. So it's not just a male patient that we have to worry about. It's anybody who may be taking sildenafil, which is the active ingredient. Okay, so to now the patient has no history of ED medication used to having chest pain. They have a history of angina, so they have nitroglycerin. Okay, so we have to make sure that their systolic blood pressure is above 120. And then we can assist them in taking nitroglycerin, which includes up to us giving it to them if they can't do it themselves. Okay, so that's basically the situation with um, you know when we could use nitroglycerin, we can't use nitroglycerin. Now, just understand that we're using nitroglycerin in this state both diagnostically and therapeutically. So what that means is that diagnostically means we're doing it to figure something out. So we give the patient with chest pain nitroglycerin, and the pain goes away we're probably leaning more towards a diagnosis of angina. If we give them nitroglycerin and it doesn't go away, we're leaning more towards a heart attack. But you have to know that nitroglycerin is still working, right? It's still uh, potent, that it's still, you know, it's not, it's been expired for years. So when we give a patient nitroglycerin, does anybody remember how do we know that it's actually working? What does the patient experience when you put it under their tongue? So basically they experience a tingling sensation, a burning sensation, and they usually get a headache. Okay. That tells you nitroglycerin is potent, it's, it's dissolving under their tongue, and it's dropping their blood pressure because of the vasodilation. So if you give somebody nitroglycerin and they tell you they feel nothing, you'd probably want to look at the expiration date and see how old that nitro is. Now, the spray form lasts much longer than the tablets. So spray is usually not an issue, but the tablets can def definitely be an issue. You know that nitroglycerin is sublingual, which means it goes under the tongue. If it's an elderly patient who cannot lift their tongue, they can't get the, you know, the the skill set to lift their tongue, you know, with your gloved hand, you're going to grab a four by four, and then you're going to grab their tongue with the four by four. That's the only way to lift someone's tongue. You can't grab it with your gloves. You just slide right off. Okay, so again, no ED medications. Okay, blood pressure above 120. We can assist somebody in taking nitroglycerin. We can give up the three doses of nitro five minutes apart. So you give the first, check the blood pressure, make sure it's above 120, give the first dose. If the pain is not relieved in five minutes, you recheck the blood pressure. If the blood pressure is above 120, you can give a second dose and so on up to a total of uh, three doses, right? as long as the systolic blood pressure stays above 120. And the patient who you suspect having a heart attack, right, should go to an angioplasty center. So for, for you know, where you are, it's going to be either Good Sam or I guess Orange Regional Medical Center would be your two uh, destination sites, depending, I guess, where you're located uh, in the town to, to go there. Okay, so what does aspirin do? We said aspirin prevents platelet aggregation, right? So again, we said that a heart attack is a thrombotic, right? Thrombotic event in the coronary artery where platelets are clogging up the artery because they sense that there's a wound there that's not really there. And by giving them aspirin, we prevent that aggregation or clumping of the platelets together to seal up the artery. The indication is somebody you think is having an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. Now, when can we not give it? So the total contradiction to the use of aspirin is somebody who has a history of anaphylaxis to aspirin, right? If they tell you they have a history of anaphylaxis to aspirin, the last thing in the world you'd want a heart attack patient to do is have an anaphylactic reaction and have to give them epi, because it probably will kill them, right? They get a shot of epinephrine in the midst of your heart already struggling to do what it needs to do. So if they tell you in the past they broke out in hives, they had shortness of breath, the doctor told them they're allergic to aspirin, then you cannot give it to them. But there would be a lot of patients who would tell you, if you say, I'm going to give you some aspirin, they're going to tell you that their doctor told them not to take aspirin. And what the story with that is that they probably had arthritic pain, right? They had joint pain and stuff like that. They were on an aspirin-based medication. 
for months, years, and they started with some GI bleed in their stomach because of the long-term aspirin use. They've been off it for years now, and we want to give them an aspirin. They say, no, 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 no. So the rule basically is that if they're not having an active GI bleed at the time of the heart attack, they can have aspirin because the benefit of those few aspirin outweighs the minor, minor risk that they may start bleeding. They're not going to really start bleeding with one dose of 325 milligrams. If they don't want to do it, you can call medical control, see if they can talk them into doing it, or you just don't do it. You know, just tell the hospital they wouldn't do it, and the hospital will give it to them, and the hospital probably not even you know, ask their opinion on it and stuff. This is showing you what happens for heart attacks. So this lower area is supposed to be the fat. And now this is a gross exaggeration. It's not like the Mount Vesuvius of fat. It's usually a thin layer of fat. And then the cells that line the heart start to grow over it. It's not the heart, but line the uh, arteries, start to grow over it to lock it in place. And then that whole cap in the fat ruptures. Typically it ruptures because of, again, stress and chronic inflammatory processes in the body. So the number one way to prevent a heart attack is not to be stressed, is to get good, good care of your teeth, have no infections going on in your body, maybe drink a glass of red wine every night, um, have some dark chocolate, you know, everything in moderation, right? Because you don't want to be, you know, have liver cirrhosis from the wine and get fat from diabetes from the chocolate. But, you know, that's basically it. If your doctor tells you your numbers of you know, your cholesterol is all off. You may need to take a cholesterol medication. If you have triglycerides, there's the bad ones and the good ones. If the good ones are low, you need to exercise. Strenuous walking will raise your triglyceride levels. Um, the more strenuous the activity, the better. A little light weight lifting, but even a, a strenuous walk where you can't carry on a conversation with someone would be good to do that. So what they're showing you there is that basically it ruptured and the platelets are going to seal off that artery, but they don't stop with just sealing off the, the wound, they actually seal off the entire artery. And again, the quicker we give them aspirin, we interfere with that process and give them more time to get into the angiotestinal center. So when we give them aspirin, it's oral, they have to chew it and swallow it. We give them 481 milligram chewable baby aspirin, we tell them to chew it and swallow it. Nitroglycerin, we said is a smooth muscle relaxant, which relaxes the blood vessels everywhere in your body, actually, which is why sometimes people faint. We're giving it for its ability to relax the blood vessels in the, the coronary arteries of the heart. We use it for people having chest pain, specifically angina, but if we don't know the difference, we can give it in a heart attack. It's not going to necessarily hurt them. So contraindications, obviously, we can't give any medication if the patient's allergic to it. Um, not very common to have allergies to nitroglycerin, although recently I did have a patient who said, swore up and down, that when they take nitroglycerin, they break out in hives. I didn't want to say impossible, but they, you know, because they told me that it happened. So obviously, it probably is possible. I also had a patient recently who swore up and down, they broke out in hives with an albuterol treatment. Well, who knows? Their systolic blood pressure should be above 120. So if it's below 120, it's a contraindication. And then the other thing I wrote down there, which again would be a little hard to figure out, is the suspected inferior wall of mine. Nitrates and inferior wall amides do not mix well. So if you go on a call and the medics are not there, you have to do a 12 lead. And your patient's complaining more of GI symptoms and their heart rate is normal, say 60s versus 70s and 80s, um, that's probably more of the inferior wall amide. So I would stay away from the nitrates until somebody does a 12 lead because if they see on a 12 lead ST elevation and leads 2, 3, and ABF, that is very indicative of a inferior wall amide. And nitrates, most people will not give nitrates to an inferior wall amide. Now, My apologies. a couple other things with um, the erectile dysfunction medications, right? So we said that Viagra Cialis Elytra, 72-hour window, we can't give it to them. That medication is being used to treat a couple other conditions. It's being used to treat a condition called pulmonary hypertension, which is where somebody gets high blood pressure from the right side of their heart to their lung. Typically, it's caused by a COPD, um, but women can get what's called idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, even if they're not a smoker. A young woman you know, prime of life, all of a sudden starts getting short of breath, they can't figure out why. They shoot a chest x-ray, think she's got pneumonia, they don't see anything. Eventually she gets to a, you know, a better doctor who kind of figures out that for no fault of her own, it becomes more difficult for the right side of her heart to pump to her lungs. And again, for some reason, the sedelophil, the active ingredient by Agrodovitrin Cialis is very beneficial because it's a smooth muscle relax. Uh, people having pulmonary embolisms also get this you know, right-sided problem. 
Um, you know, so there's other uses. And since a woman could have pulmonary hypertension the same way a man can, if you're going to give nitro to anybody, you'd want to ask what kind of history they have and just make sure they don't have pulmonary hypertension. They don't have BPH, which is when the prostate gland in a man is large and they have problems urinating with a steady stream, okay, and stuff like that. Because all of, the, all of those conditions lend themselves to sudden vasodilation and drop in blood pressure, which is harmful for a patient having a heart attack. You don't want somebody having a heart attack to be hypertensive, you know, you know, 170, 180 or something like that, but the same token, they have to have a blood pressure because if you're not circulating blood, you cannot keep your heart fused. We can give up to three doses of sublingual nitro and under its tongue, five minutes apart as long as the blood pressure stays above 120 and they continue to have chest pain. So if they have chest pain, check their blood pressure, it's over 120, no ED medication use, okay? You then give them one nitroglycerin you wait about five minutes. If the pain's not relieved, you recheck their blood pressure. If it's still above 120, you can give a second one, and so on up to three doses. It goes sublingually under the tongue. Okay. And I think that's basically what I had. Um, so I'm going to unmute everyone. If anybody has any questions, and then what I did differently for this month is um, I actually printed out the exam and I reviewed it with everyone. And I'm sure, and that's not because Nancy yelled at me last month but uh, just to make it a little fairer because some people felt the questions were a little hard. So we'll review it and just make sure that everybody feels comfortable with the material and that I covered everything I was supposed to cover. So does anybody have any questions on anything that we went over in the lecture? So, hey, so is Nancy still with us? Nancy, you got to ask the first question. Okay, as per the New York State Protocol, the correct dosage of aspirin to be administered to an adult patient experience signs and symptoms of an acute myocardial infarction is. So we said by the protocol, right, it's which one? The total Three, would be A. Right, 324. Good. Okay. Again, sometimes on tests will be rounded up to 325 because it's 81 point something. Okay. Which of the following are possible signs and symptoms of an acute myocardial infarction in a 72-year-old uh, patient. So fatigue, we said, is a very common symptom in the elderly. Mm -hmm. Chest pain is common in all heart attack patients, right, regardless of their age. Abdominal discomfort is common in the inferior wall MI, so a 72-year-old can have an inferior wall MI. Jaw pain is a common place for radiation, and nausea is common in the inferior wall MI. So all of those are possible symptoms in an elderly patient. The one that's probably not common in the 50-year-old, okay, would be the fatigue, right? That would be more common in the elderly patient. But this is 72 years old, so the answer would be all of them. Oops. Jumping all over the place. Okay. The most common cause of death in the 24 hours surrounding a patient's acute myocardial infarction is. So 90% of people who die after a heart attack, okay, within the first 24 hours, die of something called sudden cardiac death, which is because of the ischemia, the lack of oxygen to the heart muscle, they go into VFib. Not just boom, they just go into VFib. That's why people post heart attack are always on a monitored bed, right, where they're hooked up to an EKG that's monitored at the nurse's station. So if they were to go in VFib, the machine would alarm and they could be defibrillated quickly. So that's the number one cause. The number one, the second most common cause is if the part of their heart that was involved in their heart attack was their ventricles, that they go into failure from ventricular muscle damage. But this one saying the number one cause, but the most common cause would be primary VFib, which is what we call sudden cardiac death. And we do have a way of treating that. Right? We just had a, uh, a big Swedish, 70 something year old Swedish gentleman, looked like he could still take down trees at a church. Um, and he, uh, he syncopized. So, First of all, it was a hell of a time getting him out because he fell between the bench and the, uh, you know, in the pews over there. He was huge, big, big, huge guy. But anyway, as they're getting him out, he starts coming to. He says he's fine. He's got a little cut on his head. He doesn't want to go to the hospital. And uh, he was with his uh, granddaughter. So she was a devastatingly beautiful, blonde, tall Swedish girl. So everybody was kind of chatting her up, right? And this, poor, this guy doesn't want to go. And they finally convinced him to go. And they put him in the ambulance. The, the granddaughter's following behind in the car. Goes in BLS because he's got a blood pressure. He's awake. I think personally it was a bad choice. And I, turn, I turned out to be right. 
but they send them in VLS. They go from uh, Route 59 to turn onto 9W to go to Nyack Hospital. And he basically keels over on a stretcher. And uh, they kind of push him back up thinking he fainted again, but he looks pretty dead and he was dead. So he, the reason he fainted in the, um, uh, not hospital, in the church was he went into VTAC. And the reason that he coded in the ambulance was that he went to VTAC without a pulse, which is treated as V-fib. He is a BLS ambulance. Thank God the EMT in the back, even though he was probably equally as old as the patient, <laughs> had, a, had the wherewithal um, to say, you know, I'm going to get the AD and shock him. And he actually hooked up the AD, even though he was like three minutes from Nyack Hospital. And just as they pulled into the emergency room, he delivered the first shock with the driver of the ambulance screaming into the radio for everybody to intercept him, even though they were three minutes from the hospital. The, the medics had called to the emergency room and said, we don't know what the ambulance has, but they're screaming for help and have somebody out there meet him. So long and short, they opened the back door of the ambulance and this big guy sitting there talking to the other old guy who's broke out in the cold sweat. <laughs> so <laughs> the EMT looked like he was the patient. And um, the guy wound up getting an implantable, uh, the people went down to Columbia and wound up getting, I'm sorry, wound up going to Montefiore and got an implantable uh, defibrillator. So he was very fortunate that it didn't happen while he was asleep at night and nobody would have known about it and he would have been dead. Mm. So, so it does happen. Okay, so number four is what facility is the most appropriate EMS destination, okay, for a patient with sudden cardiac arrest to achieve return of spontaneous circulation in the field? So what does that mean? It means they were dead and we saved them in the field. So where should we transport them to? So the hospitals that do angioplasty will always tell you, that's the coronary perfusion capable medical centers, that the patients do better there than a non-angioplasty center. That would be a true statement if the cause of their cardiac arrest was a heart attack because obviously they can do angioplasty and open up that artery. So the answer is actually going to be D, but in all honesty, if the cause of their cardiac arrest was not a heart attack, it was just they were not lucky and went into B-fib, they would do fine in any hospital because they just need to be monitored prior to being transferred down to a hospital to, to, that can insert a automatic implantable defibrillator in their chest. Okay, which of the following signs is a likely indicator of cardiac arrest in an unresponsive patient? So to have cardiac arrest, you have to have no pulse. So B and C does have a pulse. Cyanosis in itself is not necessarily a sign of cardiac arrest, although people who are in cardiac arrest do get cyanotic. So the, the answer would be agonal irregular breathing. So what they're really trying to say here is that when somebody dies, I think we've all seen somebody just at the moment they die, so that right after they lose consciousness, they still look like they're breathing, but it's very weird breathing, right? It's that like gasping, you know, totally irregular breathing. That's, you know, called agonal breathing. It's the correct term is called brainstem breathing. And your brainstem is the part of your brain that ties into your spinal cord, like your spinal cord comes up into your cranium, ties into your medulla or your brainstem. Your medulla controls breathing, controls vegetative functions that you don't have to be awake to need, right? So if your medulla, um, when you code, still has some oxygen, it still tries to get you to breathe. So a lot of times when people suddenly code, they will have this very irregular respiratory pattern, but they don't have a pulse. So if they don't have a pulse during cardiac arrest, it'd be important. So the answer to number five would be A. To properly vent ventilate a patient with a perfusing rhythm, how often you squeeze the bag valve mask? So that has not changed, right? If we're using the mask, one breath every five to six seconds. If they're intubated, we could slow it down to one breath every six seconds. Because once they're intubated, we know that every breath is coming into their lungs. What is the recommended next step if we defibrillate? So nowadays, after we defibrillate, the AED tells us to go into immediate CPR. So let's talk about some possible scenarios. Let's say you defibrillate somebody and they wake up. You save them. You obviously don't need to do CPR. The AED, doesn't know that person's awake. So it's going to continue to yell at you to do CPR for two minutes. So if you have a true save where you defibrillated somebody and they wake up, but you have the AED on them, what you want to do is leave the pads on the patient, leave the pads connected to the AED, but shut the AED off and just have it in place in case they lose consciousness again so you can turn it back off. So the right answer is resume CPR. Now, what about if we defibrillate somebody, we actually get them out of the defib, but they don't wake up because their brain is a little anoxic, doesn't have enough oxygen, right? But we save them, they actually have a pulse. This is telling us, go right into CPR, don't even bother to check for a pulse. So the feeling of the heart association is that if you actually convert somebody from defib into a normal rhythm, 
but they don't wake up, that normal rhythm is not yet good enough to fuse their brain, so they would actually benefit from chest compressions. So you might actually be doing CPR on someone whose heart is actually beating to increase the perfusion. And I know there's some of us that have done CPR you know, for 20, 30 years, and when we took the original classes, they told us that CPR done over a beating heart will throw it out of rhythm. So like a lot of things, as time goes on, that's been disproven. And you know, in fact, if anything, if that patient was actually awake, alive, but not awake, the chest pain from the CPR will actually wake them up and help you, you know, know that they're alive. What is the length of time it should take to perform a pulse check during the BLS assessment? So we know that ideally everything should be under 10 seconds. So it'll be A. We know that also in real life, a lot of times, you know, things take longer than five to 10 seconds, and that's okay. Right? We're always doing a way that's safe for you and safe for the patient. Okay, maximum interval we should allow for interruptions of chest compressions. Again, that's also 10 seconds. We also know, like if it was that 475 pound patient, that if he coded, it would have taken a lot longer than 10 seconds to get him out of the house and stuff like that. Which way to minimize interruptions in chest compressions during CPR. So this is an interesting one. The Heart Association wants that we do CPR while the defibrillator charges. And if you remember the last time you took CPR and we're practicing with the AED, once the pads go on a patient's chest, it says stand clear analyzing. And once it decides the shock, it also tells you to stand clear. So the manufacturers of the AEDs, for safety reasons, don't want anybody to be doing CPR once the pads are on. Okay, unless the machine tells you no shock is indicated, start C, you know, to do CPR. But most of the times it tells you, you know, to stay off the patient. The Heart Association, on the other hand, feels that the patient would benefit to do CPR up until the last minute that that guy is going to press the button to shock him. So I'll leave it up to you to decide if you're going to listen to the machine or listen to the Heart Association. I'll just tell you that most people listen to the machine. They do not do CPR when the machine says not to listen. So what answer is What right? is that answer? So the answer, well, I'll tell you, first of all, don't write like question 10 is A or anything like that because everything gets scrambled. So maybe the question 10 is not in question 10 slot. And also the choices may be mixed around and stuff like that. Sorry. But the answer would be continue CPR while the defibrillator charges. Okay. As a team leader, what do you tell the chest compressor to switch? So we're doing hands-on CPR. It's every two minutes if we don't have a lupus or something like that. So it would be B. You're performing chest compressions during adult resuscitation. Template rate should we use to do CPR. So it's 100 to 120 compressions per minute. So we do perfect CPR, you two compressions per second. We're treating a 62-year-old male patient who has a sudden onset of retrosternal chest pain and pressure, which began at rest approximately 30 minutes ago. The patient has a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, for which is taken low pressure and The patient has no known allergies, vital signs are repulsive 58 and regular. Respiration is 16 and non-labored, blood pressure 122 over 76. The pulse ox is 97% on room air. 21% FiO2 is the way you write room air. So what do we got? We got a 62-year-old guy while at rest, okay, it says, right? Listen, that's over here. Getting at rest, at chest pain, okay? And his pulse is 58. Now, pulse of 58 is usually not normal um, in a 62-year-old, but the reason he has pulse of 60, 60, 58 is why. Can anybody figure out? Low presser is a beta blocker. A beta blocker controls blood pressure by slowing the rate of the heart and slowing the strength of contraction. So that's why he has a pulse of 58. It means the low pressure is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's keeping his pulse nice and slow and therefore his blood pressure is good, right? 122 over 76. So he's, he's doing pretty good other than the fact that it sounds like he might be having a heart attack. Okay, so now what's the most important initial intervention in his patient? So what would be the, do we have to give him oxygen as the first thing if his O2 sat is 97%? No. Answer would probably be no, right? 97% is pretty good on room air. And even if we put him on oxygen, we're not gonna get it probably much higher than 97, 98%. So that's not the most important initial intervention. So now we have aspirin or nitroglycerin. So what's the one thing between the two of those things that actually minimizes death from a heart attack? Is it aspirin or is it aspirin. nitro? Aspirin, 100%. Okay, aspirin is the most important drug to get on board. I even, you know, I would even wait an extra minute, even though I hate waiting in the house, I would wait an extra minute to make sure the patient shouldn't swallow the aspirin before transport. You know, that, that's how important it is. 
14, the most serious possible side effect of aspirin administration is what? What do you think? Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis. So precipitous hypotension does not happen with aspirin. That is that we take nitro and bottom out the blood pressure, right? So that doesn't happen with aspirin. Gastrointestinal bleeding is a possible side effect of aspirin. That does, typically does not occur, okay? And seizures probably never, you know, not caused by aspirin, right? Seizures are caused by other things. So yes, anaphylaxis. Aspirin can assist a patient experiencing acute myocardial infarction by interfering with platelet irrigation or pumping, true or false? True. Yeah, so that's exactly why we give it, right? So it's just a fancy way of saying that platelets are sticking together and making a scab on the inside of the artery and closing it off, and we don't want that to happen. As per the New York State BLS protocol, a patient must have a solid blood pressure of at least blank in order for an EMT to assist the patient with nitroglycerin. So we said that's going to be 120. Okay. The paramedics have hundreds. So just don't be surprised if you held off because of 120 and they may give it at 100. I personally still abide by 120. I, nothing makes me more embarrassed to give nitroglycerin to the patient watch the feet. So I, I also hold by 120, even though I can give it at 100. When treating a 68 year old male patient who states he awoke suddenly with severe shortness of breath, the patient denies any recent illness or injury. Okay. The patient has a history of hypertension, which is being treated by a tenamol. Now remember, tenamol is another beta blocker. Okay. Patient medication was recently increased. So I put that there for a reason, right? Anytime somebody's medication has changed, you always wonder if that's why they're calling you. Physical, physical assessment reveals a frightened alert male and severe respiratory distress. Sounds are rails bilaterally, apices the bases. So that means what? That both his lungs, from top to bottom, you have rails. Vital signs are pulse 52 and regular. Again, that's the beta blocker. Respirations at 30 and labored. Blood pressure 130 over 90. Pulse oximetry at 91% on room air. So he's showing what condition. What do you think happened to him? They increased, they, well, he doesn't have chest pain, he's shortness of breath. But what happened is they increased his beta blocker and it actually made his heart beat with less force. So if the heart's not pushing enough blood out into the aorta, that blood has to back up into the lungs. And because they changed his dose of atenol, probably to manage his blood pressure, right? They probably thought they were doing the right thing, but it just went too high. I mean, it's, it's you know, an honest mistake, so to speak. He went into failure because they changed his dose of atenol, basically what happened. He went into congestive heart failure for many years. So I he wrote here, which of the following is the most beneficial to the patient? So in acute pulmonary edema, we said before the most you know, appropriate intervention for all of us to administer would be CPAP. And the protocol says that you guys use CPAP at 10. Um, CPAP at 10 is like tickling the patient, in all honesty. There's people who have sleep apnea and have CPAPs of 25. So a CPAP of 10 millimeters of mercury is not a very high um, heat pressure. So you're not gonna probably help them a whole lot, but you're not gonna hurt them more either. So question 17 would be A. Question 18, you're called to a business establishment where you find a 70 year old male complaining of severe substernal chest pain. The pressure that started while he was fighting with another patron. The patient states pain came on suddenly. It was a scale of nine to 10, a nine on a scale of one to 10. The patient denies any recent illness or injury. The patient has a history of prostate cancer. Sorry, uh, I couldn't hear what you said. patient states similar symptoms last month while shoveling the snow. The patient state pain has slightly diminished since bone enforcement has placed him on oxygen. So we had a guy who developed chest pain with exertion, with stress. And that pain is starting to go away with relaxation and oxygen. So because of that, what do, what do we suspect as the cause? Angina. Probably angina, right? Because think about it. If it's acute myocardial infarction, the pain probably is not going away. If it's a muscle strain, the pain is probably not going away. Right? We've, all, we've all strained the muscle. It takes days for it to even start feeling a little better. Okay. A, thor a thoracic, thoracic aortic aneurysm, pain only goes away if it bursts, but then you're, be you're dead. Or if they fix it, which again, we're not doing that in the field. So the only thing where the pain may slightly go away is in China. But, you know, as a, as a uh, disclaimer, you're still going to treat that patient as a heart attack because you can't be 100% certain. So again, you know, if his O2 sat is low, you're going to put him in some oxygen, you're going to give him aspirin, and you're going to take him, take him to the hospital. And if he has a nitro because he has angina, you're going to give him the nitroglycerin. Mm -hmm. If you want to hold off on the aspirin because 
you really don't think it's a heart attack, you have to call medical control and say, you know, I have a guy with chest pain, but it's getting better. Do you want us to give the aspirin or not? And they're probably going to tell you to give the aspirin, to be honest with you. We have just administered one dose of sublingual nitro to a 64 year old male patient with a history of exertional chest pain. The patient tells you that while raking leaves, he develops some external chest pain that is typical for his angina. The patient's vital signs are blood pressure 140 over 90, pulse of 94 and regular, respiration is 24 and labored, pulse ox is 94% on room air. We assisted the patient taking a sublingual nitroglycerin. And now the patient states, I feel like I have to vomit and pass out. The patient suddenly loses apologies. consciousness and does not respond to verbal stimuli. So what happened, right? I think this guy took nitro and bottomed out his blood pressure, right? And when you bottom out your blood pressure, you faint because you're not getting enough blood to your brain. And a lot of times that's accompanied with nausea. So we basically gave this guy nitro. He didn't tolerate it well and he fainted. So we have to hopefully prevent him from hurting himself on the way down keep him supine, elevate his legs a little bit, put him on some oxygen, and he slowly start coming around. So now I said, in what order do you provide treatment? So this is my order, and it's the right answer, how I would think you should do it. So I would put the patient supine and elevate their legs, because you kind of know what happened. Now, could he add a V-fib arrest and coat it in front of you? Sure, could have, right? But more than likely, you just syncopize him with the nitro. So I would lay him flat and elevate their legs first, because the next thing I would do is check for a pulse. And sometimes, you know, if you check for a pulse before they're flat, you may just not find one because they bottomed out their blood pressure, and now you're gonna think they're in cardiac arrest. So I'd lay them flat first, elevate their legs a little bit, okay? Check for a pulse. Obviously, if there's no pulse, you're gonna start CPR, okay? But again, this guy just probably syncopized. Now, after that, right, after five and, and three, I'm sorry, five and two, okay, what's the next thing? Three. So I would say put him on some oxygen, absolutely. And then I would do four, get a new set of vital signs. And then, you know, if you have an ALS unit coming, you could tell them, you know, the patient's syncopized. You know, I don't think it's an emergency that they have to come flying lights and sirens, you know, uh, crazy, craziness, but you know, it's basically, you know what happened, you know how to treat it. And uh, pretty much the guy just guaranteed to arrive to the hospital. But other than that, there's no real big emergency. So a lot of people answer, Number one, as the first choice, but you know you guys are fairly competent uh, ENTs. I think you know what would happen and how to manage it. So. Okay, and then the last one: which of the following patients commonly present with atypical symptoms when experiencing symptoms of acute myocardial infarction? All of them. All of them. Absolutely. Okay, so was that helpful to do a little review um, of the? Uh, of the uh, test? I think mm -hmm. so. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to email out the test. Lori, I know you just signed on, but the class is done. So I guess hook up with someone. Um, but um, I'm gonna email out the test. Now the issue is I see there's some people on the lecture that I don't know necessarily have your email address. So if you're not getting um, the email, then just reach out to somebody else, you know, or maybe, maybe you know, um, Everybody, you know, if you could, if you have uh, access to the the uh, agency's email list, if you could just re-email out, uh, forward out my link to anybody who didn't get it. Okay, um, and if that's the case that you're not getting anything from me, then please, you know, reach out to somebody who has my email address and shoot me an email or a text so I can add you add you to the list so that you uh, you get it uh, the next time. Okay, unless anybody has any questions, we are done. Everybody have a safe. An enjoyable weekend, Fourth of July, and all that stuff. Remember, it looks like we're going to be having a uh, a second wave of the COVID. Right? We have a cluster in Rockland now. We have a cluster in Westchester, and uh, you know, <laughs> it looks like we're going to have a second wave. And you've got multiple states that are having a first wave, and some states having second waves. So it does look like it. So keep your supplies of PPE up. And I know we've all gotten a little lackadaisical, but you know, just make sure you're protecting yourself when you're going on these calls, um, it's probably gonna get back to the point where we're gonna treat every patient as being COVID positive, uh, you know, moving forward. The other thing is, if you're a high risk, you know, category, you know, maybe you're a little older, or you have lung disease, or maybe you're on immune suppressant medications, I would, I would probably take a leave of absence for the time being uh, until this all blows over and stuff like that if you're high risk. Um, and then, 
you know, the last thing would be is, you know, we had that, that brief spurt of the um, COVID in the young kids, which is still occurring, but, you know, not as, uh, not as much as it was two or three weeks ago. But what's happening is in these states where they're getting COVID for the first time, it seems to be hitting teenagers, like uh, late teenage, early 20s. And that's probably just because of the partying and all that stuff where they're in close proximity. But it is hitting, you know, younger 20s, you know, age patients more than it is hitting people older than that, where when we had it in New York, it was hitting more, you know, the elderly patients um, and stuff like that. So, you know, it's definitely changed a little bit. Okay. Okay. So we are done until uh, August and I guess we'll decide if Warwick wants to have one in August and if not, we'll pick up it again in September. So we don't uh, pick up in August. Everybody have a good summer. And um, I guess that's it. Have a good night. Be well. Thank you, Frank. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.